What if I told you that in 1979, nine years after the Beatles broke up, there was a very real chance they could have got back together, but didn't because of a clerical error made by Eric Clapton? Eric, what were you playing at? You ignorant f Hi, I'm Adam, welcome back to Music Mongoose. The breakup of the Beatles was big news. So big that the Earth actually stopped rotating for a full minute. To be honest though, it was a long time coming. You could say the breakup was destined ever since the Beatles stopped being a performing band in 1966, following a pretty dicey tour of Germany, Japan and the Philippines, as well as that fateful tour of the US. You know, the one where John Lennon said they were more popular than Jesus. Which to be fair, they probably were. I don't remember Jesus releasing an album that sold millions worldwide. Did he? Anyway, since that point, the Beatles were, to put it plainly, around each other less often. There were less commitments to touring around and, naturally, it freed all four members up to pursue other projects. It's like when you're finally old enough to go out and play with your friends instead of sitting around with your miserable ugly parents. George Harrison released a smattering of albums, John Lennon with Yoko Ono did the same, and the other Beatles were writing and recording in the background, each eventually releasing their own solo album in 1970, the year of the breakup. Paul McCartney famously used the pseudonym Billy Martin to record his solo album to keep the breakup and his endeavours secret. And fun fact, an anagram of Billy Martin is Mil Biarton, which, uh, which is interesting. Speaking of Paul McCartney, everybody seems to remember him as the reason the Beatles broke up. At least that's how the Daily Mirror reported it anyway. But the fact is, John wanted to announce the breakup six months before that newspaper was published. And neither John nor Paul were the first to actually leave the Beatles. It was Ringo. Peace and love. Peace and love. That's, uh, my, that's my Ringo impression. While recording the White Album in 1968, Ringo Starr was more fed up than a really fed up cat that you keep spraying water at, and quit the band. He came back after two weeks, but technically he was the first to walk out. The second Beatle to call it quits was George Harrison in 1969. He grew frustrated with the fact his songs were being overlooked, despite writing some absolutely dirty stonking banger crackers like something, and here comes the sun. Again, he eventually came back for one last hurrah, but you can see the cracks were definitely showing. So Paul wasn't the first to quit. He wasn't the second to quit. Was he the third? No, or at least that's what he says. To this day, Paul insists it was John who put that final nail in the coffin and broke up the Beatles. So he wasn't the first, second, or third to quit, and yet he gets all the blame for it the power of the tabloids for you. So, 1970, the band was officially no more. Fans around the world were devastated. Some even moved to the moon in protest. George Harrison went on to produce probably the best Beatles solo album of them all, All Things Must Pass, and by the way, My Sweet Lord from that album resulted in one of the biggest legal battles of all time. There's a link to a video on that in the description, along with some other goodies. Go on, have a peek down there. Ringo Starr, while not remaining in the spotlight as much as the others, did have a fairly successful solo career, releasing the acclaimed hits Sentimental Journey, Back Off Boogaloo, and his biggest effort, It Don't Come Easy. Oh, and of course he narrated a children's television show about terrifying talking trains. Paul McCartney released two solid solo albums and then formed Wings. They toured the globe and became the best-selling pop act of the 1970s with five consecutive number one albums. So Paul did pretty well then. And John Lennon, of course, worked closely with Yoko Ono to produce his first post-Beatles album, John Lennon Plastic Ono Band, and also went on to release his much more critically and commercially successful album, Imagine, in 1971, where his old pal Georgie joined him on the guitar for the album. So how the bloody flipping heck does Eric Clapton come into all this, and how did the Beatles nearly reform? Well, it's all to do with a wedding party. More specifically, the wedding party for Eric Clapton and Patty Boyd. 
George Harrison's ex-wife. Don't worry though, no hard feelings between George and Eric, it was all cool. In fact, they'd continued to record and even tour together well into the 90s. Their friendship outlasted both their relationships with Boyd. She was a photographer and leading international model of the 60s. She proved to be somewhat of a muse for both Harrison and Clapton. Reportedly being the subject of Harrison's songs I Need You, If I Needed Someone, Something and For You Blue, and Clapton's songs Layla, Bell Bottom Blues and Wonderful Tonight. That is one special lady. By the way, her sister Jenny Boyd married Mick Fleetwood, and she was at the centre of a dramatic Fleetwood Mac breakup mid-tour of the USA. I've linked a video to that downstairs as well. A few weeks after the wedding, Clapton and Boyd went about throwing a monster of a wedding party in their house in Surrey. On the guest list were the likes of Mick Jagger, Jeff Beck, Elton John, Bill Wyman, Jack Bruce and Denny Lane. There was a marquee set up with the idea that anyone could hop on stage and become the wedding band if they fancied. I mean, it's, it's better than an actual wedding band, isn't it? Could you imagine turning up to play that gig and in the audience is Mick Jagger, Eric Clapton and Elton John? You would sh your pants. Anyway, this is where things get interesting, because also on that guest list was Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr. And in a moment that's gone down in history as the closest moment to the Beatles ever reforming, all three of them got on stage and jammed their lovely little Beatle hearts out. Legend has it they performed Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Get Back, and Lordy Miss Claudy. Denny Lane would later say the set sounded rubbish. But come on, think of all the alcohol and drugs that must have been in their system. It was an Eric Clapton party, after all. Now, the elephant in the room, or the uh, the John Lennon not in the room, or, or something. Where the heck was John Lennon? Three out of four Beatles jammed and performed together on that stage. One can only imagine what would have happened if John Lennon was there to join them. Could that have been the reunion of the Beatles? As to why Lennon wasn't in attendance, we turn to Eric Clapton's autobiography. George, Paul and Ringo also played, only missing John, who later phoned me to say that he would have been there too if he had known about it. How that came about, I'll never know. Suffice to say, I had little to do with the invitations. Had little to do with the invitations? So Eric Clapton denied the Beatles getting back together because he forgot to check the guest list. How tragic is that? A year later, of course, Lennon was sadly murdered in New York City. Do you think they would have reformed had John been a part of that jamming session? Let me know in the comments. If you want to learn that story of how George Harrison was sued for his biggest hit, My Sweet Lord, check the video on screen and I'll catch you next time on Music Mongoose.